Shalom, welcome to Jewish Christian Studies. In the year of 2018, we celebrated many historical events and anniversaries. 30 years ago, we were in this same studio when we started Jewish Christian Dialogue with Rabbi Meyer, called that series, but on the Ecumenical Television Channel. And Brother Dominic, Dominic is still with us at the Society of St. Paul, who was cameraman at that time. So 30 years ago, huh? I don't look at it, a day older. Huh? And then, of course, we had Nostra Aetate, that big document in 1965 that came out of Vatican Council II, which gave the Roman Catholics permission to deal with Jewish Christian studies and remembering that Christianity has been rooted in Judaism. Huh? 1965, with uh, Blessed Now, Paul, Pope Paul VI, on October 28, 1965, 53 years ago. Then in 1947, out in the Dead Sea area, around the, that part of uh, the Holy Land, they found scrolls in the caves that are pictured behind me here, 71 years ago. That was last year, huh? 71 years. It would have been 70 years last year. Huh? This year, we celebrated 1948, uh, the independence of Israel, the reestablishment of the state of Israel with the vote of the United Nations. Uh, that was done in 1947, but then the state was established in 1948. But many difficulties in the sense up to this time coming to the year 2018. Uh, and then 25 years ago in 1993, we had the passing of Rabbi Meyer of happy memory. And so that would bring to a close his lecture series this year, morphing it together with the Nostria Tate series that we have at the Villa in Villa Maria, Pennsylvania, at the Educational Center and the Conference Center there at Villa Maria, Pennsylvania. And with the Nostria Tate series, we had a series of lectures concerning our Jewish and historical roots of Christianity and moving from that series, our not our final, in our last one, we have 70 years of the state of Israel and the Dead Sea, Dead sea Scrolls. Do they matter? And we brought in Dr. Lawrence A. Schiffman, who will speak upon the Dead Sea Scrolls and give us that history since that first lecture with Father Fitzmaier, who, by the way, just passed away recently. We found that out from Dr. Lawrence when he visited us at the villa and to give this lecture. He was one of the great scholars on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He lived at the Ecole Biblique, and that's where many of these scrolls were actually worked on and studied and to find out who wrote them, who published them, in the sense who uh, produced them, in the sense were they brought in from many places and then stored there, or were they produced at the, uh, the uh, Ecole, uh, where the studies, in the sense, uh, at the uh, monastery or what they found at the... Uh, the area of uh, Qumran. And so, as we get ready to hear Dr. Lawrence in his presentation, I want you to be aware in the sense that these are all updates. This is the latest we have on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and also the, the documents that were found at the, uh, the synagogue down in Cairo, Egypt, uh, in the Geniza, the storage room and all that. Some of those documents really match what they found at the Dead Sea. And so, with further ado, let us now go to the villa and hear from Dr. Lawrence Schiffman on this Nostria Tate lecture series. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here and participate in this kind of a program. It's nice to see so many people came out. I was telling the funny story that I gave a lecture in the Cleveland College of Jewish Studies and they had about 300 chairs. And they made the mistake of having me interviewed 
on television, ABC News, at 3.30 in the afternoon was the interview, but they put it on the news like at 6 o'clock, and the lecture was that evening, and they had 650 people there in 350 chairs, and the fire department came, and all this stuff was going on, <laughs> and it was written up in the paper the next time, so it's good to see that we had enough chairs here and that everybody is happily ensconced. Also, I want to say that uh, this is clearly, this evening, is part of something which I see here is a wonderful series of programs programs, which is accomplishing something that, interestingly, many of us as Americans have started to take for granted. But nonetheless, I think the change in Jewish-Catholic relations that have taken place since Nostra Aetate, which we may take for granted, we should still understand really is an amazing miracle and uh, really a testimony to the wonderful things that can be done when people are dedicated to the goals and aspirations. So it's in that spirit that I offer this talk tonight, which I hope will help you to understand the relevance of the Dead Sea Scrolls to, on one hand, the state of Israel, some extent to Jewish-Christian uh, relations, and to your own commitments. And it can be a start for some of you to study the scrolls. There are a lot of wonderful hobbyists out there, and it would be wonderful if some of you were to join that group, because the scrolls are a fascinating area of study. Now, we have to begin by understanding something about the prehistory of the discussion about the scrolls. Actually, the story does not start with the famous Bedouin boy. It really starts with the beginning of the coming of manuscripts from something we call the Cairo Geniza, the storehouse of the synagogue in old Cairo, to Europe in the end of the 19th century. And among those manuscripts, some were brought to Cambridge, actually a quarter of a million, were brought to Cambridge, England, where Solomon Schechter, who later on became president of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, the conservative rabbinical school, in sorting through these manuscripts, he found actually two manuscripts of a text that's known either as the fragments of a Tzadokite work or the Damascus document, which was essentially a text that we now know was part of the Dead Sea Scrolls corpus. But these were in medieval manuscripts. Somehow this text had survived into the Middle Ages. And in this text was a description of, on the one hand, the ideology of a sectarian group, and also at the same time, there was a whole kind of discussion there of various topics of Jewish law. Now, one of the most interesting things that happened was that the discovery and publication of the text, in 1911 it was published, launched a discussion on who are the sectarians, which in a certain sense was a kind of pre-run of the discussion that would take place in 47, 48, 49, after the scrolls were discovered. Now, this discussion included every possibility. It could be early Christians. It could be Sadducee priests. It could be the Pharisees who were the forerunners of the Talmudic rabbis. It could be the medieval sect of the Karaites, who were literalists who, beginning in the 8th century CE of our era, were basically putting forward a Jewish ideology that had certain things in common with this ancient sect. The debate went on until it was silenced, essentially, by World War II and the Holocaust. And then it was, of course, not much afterwards that in the area that we know of as Qumran, at the top of the shore of the Dead Sea, approximately there, that in these various caves, and this is the area over here below Jericho, the, what we know of today as the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Now this reopened the whole discussion, and I want to quickly make sure that everyone understands that that very text that had been found in the middle, in the medieval manuscript, would be found in 10 copies in the Qumran caves, so there was no question that this was a text of the Qumran sectarians. Now, of course, it's at this point that the famous Bedouin boy goes into what we know of as Cave One. Eventually, there would be 11 caves, and Cave One yielded what we generally term the seven original scrolls. These were the ones that were wrapped in jars. Most of the other material was not. And furthermore, inside the jars, they were wrapped in cloths. Now, in these, of course, were the scrolls. You happen to see here a commentary on the book of Habakkuk. And eventually, these scrolls, of course, started a whole new academic field, but not without some various arguments and conflicts.
Now this was a very special time in the history of what would become the state of Israel. Because the Bedouin went into that cave at approximately just a short time before the UN voted the partition plan. Now, the partition plan, and I don't mean to be being political here, which was originally voted, actually was originally put forward in 1939, is essentially what we today call the two-state solution, and it has not ever been accepted by the Palestinians, but nonetheless, for the scholar, namely Elazar Lipa Sukanik, who was the first Jewish scholar to realize the important, in fact, the first scholar at all, to realize the importance of these new documents. He was actually working on the Isaiah scroll, where it said, Be comfort ye, comfort ye my people. In Isaiah 40, he was working on that as the people were dancing in the streets below, all over, he was in Jerusalem, and were dancing in the streets. So actually the Dead Sea Scrolls come into play just as the period of the Holocaust is winding down. There are still people in DP camps into the, or 1950 or so. They're still in DP camps, but the state of Israel is being declared just a little bit afterwards. Now, this original material came from uh, the collection, actually there were two collections you might say, there was this fellow Kondo, who's the guy with the fez here, who eventually became the person who bought all of the scrolls for the Bedouin who were finding them and sold them to initially Sukenik, the Israeli scholar, and later to the Jordanian Antiquities Department. Now of the first seven scrolls, their first group was, as I mentioned, they were, of the first seven, they were divided into lots of three and four. One lot was purchased by Professor Sukenik directly from Kondo. The second lot was in the possession of someone who we call the Syrian Metropolitan. That's like being a bishop. And of the Syriac Church in Jerusalem. Syriac is a dialect of Aramaic. These are Aramaic-speaking Christians. At any rate, in 1954, Yigael Yadin, who is, by the way, the son of Sukenik, he got the name Yadin in the War of Independence. Yigael Yadin was in Baltimore, and a journalist friend of him told him, of his told him, that there was an ad in the Wall Street Journal for the remaining Dead Sea Scrolls of the original seven. So he went into action immediately, succeeded in buying those. By this time, there was a state of Israel after 1948. Now, there were two groups of scrolls here. The condo material sold to Sukenik included what we call the Isaiah B manuscript. That's an Isaiah manuscript of most of the second half of the book that looks just like our Hebrew Bibles. The so-called Thanksgiving scroll, not to be confused with a liturgy for the holiday of Thanksgiving. And you think this is funny, but I went to visit a very small synagogue where friends of ours are members for Thanksgiving weekend. And they had a clever idea. They announced at the end of services, without talking to me, that in the afternoon I would give a class about the Thanksgiving scroll. <laughs> and I told them this is great because I've made this joke a hundred times and I've never been invited to speak about the scroll. Why is it called Thanksgiving scroll? Because it's poems that begin, I give thanks unto you. In any case, and then the war scroll was one of the ones that they got at the beginning. That's a scroll that describes the messianic war that they were sure would take place the minute the Romans conquered, or they tried to conquer, the land of Israel in 63 BCE. We know, of course, the Romans did conquer. Don't get confused. That's not the destruction of the temple in 70 CE. The 63 BCE is when the last of the Maccabean descendants were overthrown and the Romans took over the land of Israel. And then the second group that went to Athanasius Samuel, the Syrian Metropolitan, and was sold to Yigael Yadin, the Isaiah A scroll, which is the totality of the book of Isaiah, amazing scroll. The commentary, we call it Pesher in Hebrew on Habakkuk. The community role that outlined the way the sect was structured and the Genesis Apocryphon, which is a rewrite in Aramaic of parts of Genesis, well actually the whole Genesis, but we have only some parts, which tells the biblical stories with additions similar to the rabbinic Midrash commentary. Now, these are the materials, by the way, about Athanasia Samuel. After he sold the manuscripts to Yadin, he stayed in New Jersey. And he lived out the rest of his life in New Jersey on the quarter of a million dollars that he got for selling the scrolls. 
Now, in May 14, 1948, there was declaration of the state of Israel's independence, and of course, the war began between Israel and all the Arab neighbors that attacked it immediately. But we are not really talking about what's important right now, because that whole story is a very important story, but we're talking about the scrolls. The significance of this for the scrolls was that it changed the border, because what happened at that time, if you look at the map here, you see the original Israel was the Galilee the little strip over here eight miles wide which was the dangerous strip that they always feared could be cut off by an attack and the Negev but the area of the West Bank including Qumran was invaded by Jordan remember now again this is not politics this is just history right it was British mandatory Palestine the British simply left. They gave up on trying to figure out what to do because they had promised the Jews and Arabs the same thing. So they left. When they left, the Arabs attacked the state in formation because Israel had just declared a statehood. Now, what then happened was that the Jordanians, in the war, they conquered the part of mandatory Palestine that we call the West Bank or Judea and Samaria. That's how it got conquered. It stayed in their hands until 1967. So as a result of that, Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, was now in Jordan. This had a very big effect on everything that would now happen. So the Jordanians, they began to purchase this Dead Sea Scrolls materials because they realized immediately that, ah, oh, here's Athanasia Samuel. He shouldn't be here. It's in the wrong order, but okay. Now, the Jordanians purchased all these Dead Sea Scrolls materials. And after purchasing these materials, the Bedouin were finding them. What happened is archaeologists went to excavate Qumran. While they were excavating, the Bedouin that were working for them, the archaeologists went to Jerusalem for the weekend, and then the Bedouin would find scrolls, and then they would sell them to the Jordanian Antiquities Department, and they would go to what is now the Rockefeller Museum. It was then the Palestine Archaeological Museum that you saw a few slides ago. The Jordanians then assembled a so-called interconfessional team, which meant Protestants and Catholics, who were supposed to publish the scrolls. This is the group that failed. Just a few people. This is Father DeVoe, who was a great archaeologist and a great scholar, but he, his excavations of Qumran are only published now, I mean, years and years after his death. Father Millick, who's then, he, by the time he passed away, he was Mr. Millick, but leave that aside. He was supposed to publish an amount of scrolls that would have taken him 150 years to publish. And then you have over here Starkey, a great, ex, uh, a great scholar of Aramaic, who never published a single one of his texts. This is John Allegro, who is the guy who put out the idea that Christianity was a mushroom cult and all this kind of stuff, right, which you may remember from hearing about in the 60s. And he published his scrolls, ironically. He was the only one who published his scrolls. So this is the team that did not succeed. And that is why it happened that even in 67, when this area was kind conquered by Israel, this team continued to be in power and didn't let anyone see the scrolls, and they kept it secret, and there were all kinds of rumors and why it was, and believe me, the real reason it was is a combination. Some were alcoholics, some were incompetent, some didn't care, some lacked funding, and just basically nothing was happening with the scrolls. Here you see John Strugnell. He succeeded DeVoe, and then there was DeVoe, then Benoit, then him as the editor-in-chief. And what's important about this picture is you can see how they handled the materials. They put them in glass plates. Remember, in the interim, in 1954, Cave 4, as we call it, was discovered. It had remnants of about 550 manuscripts. This is the famous jigsaw puzzle that was so difficult to put together. And they did it on these tables here. And when they did it, they did it in bright daylight while smoking, drinking coffee, putting scotch tape, literally. There are these women now that came to Israel from Russia that were trained in the field of papyrology, study of Greek papyri in Russia. And their entire job is cleaning and fixing the fragments to get off these scotch tape and all kind of other stuff. They even use, remember the old stamps had that white paper around, right? They even stuck the white paper to hold pieces of fragments. And this is what they do with 2,000, 2,200 year old fragments, many of which were of the Bible. In fact, this is a good time to point out while we're looking at this, that the scroll material comes in three basic subjects. 
the first third, if we're going to call it that, are Hebrew Bible slash Old Testament minus the book of Esther that didn't appear. Not complete books, but fragmentary books. Then we have what we call apocryphal books. Now, some of these are actually books like Tobit, which are in the Catholic Apocrypha. But we use the term apocryphal to mean books like the Bible and about the Bible, not just the 12 books that are in the Catholic Bible, which were in the Septuagint Greek Bibles. But the third third is what everyone's excited about. That's the literature of the strange sect with its strange ideology. They believed in predestination. They believed the world was divided into the people of good and the people of evil. They believed that there would be this great messianic war and that they would emerge victorious. That strange group of the Dead Sea sectarians, their literature is the third third. Now, immediately under the Jordanians, they set to excavating the site of Qumran. But then, as you know, in the Six-Day War, this area passed to Israel. As a result of it passing to Israel, so a lot of very influential people, this is Yiga El Yadin here, of Israeli scholars wanted very much for Israel to do something about the fact that the scrolls were not being published. However, they didn't do anything. They tolerated the situation into the late 80s when they were being told over and over, by that time Strugdale was the head of the, of the Scrolls publication team, over and over that the material was in the process of being published. But then a very important thing happened. The Knesset, the Israeli parliament, basically forced them to take in a few Israeli scholars. And one of them, Alicia Kimron, in 1984, spoke at a biblical archaeology conference about this text that they call MMT. MMT is a collection of laws, but basically it's a text that gives the reason why the sect left Jerusalem to construct their own sectarian center at Qumran near the Dead Sea. And that announcement is what triggered the campaign to get all the scrolls released. And the initial article by Herschel Shanks of the Biblical Archaeology Review took place after a conference that I actually held at NYU, where he began to editorialize about this, and there began the campaign that led Israel to step in, so that by 1991 they had basically thrown these people out. Now, another aspect that happened during the Six-Day War, which is very important, is that Yadin recovered the Temple Scroll. Now, I tell you this is so important because I love this scroll, because I've already published two books on it, and the third one is being finished. In fact, I got from one of my partners, we have a bunch of collaborators in a new edition translation and commentary. I didn't even read it yet. I saw in my email that there are some reports from one of the colleagues about what he did today in finishing it up. We're about to send it to press, and it'll be another month or so, and this, this work will go, it'll, it'll go to press. So at any rate, it's a gigantic scholarly enterprise we've been working working on for years. But what I wanted to point out about this is that this scroll is a great story. Because Yiga El Yadin had been commander of the Israeli army in the 1948 war. He in fact invented the whole system of reserves and how the army is organized. Now, in 67, Yadin knew that there was a scroll in the hands of Kondo. What had happened, remember Kondo, the guy with the fez. What had happened is this, in 1960, a fellow named Reverend Joe Urig, who by the way gave Jerry Falwell his first job, came to Yadin and gave him some small pieces of a manuscript and told him if he gave him $10,000 he could get the rest. Yadin gave him $10,000 and he disappeared. <laughs> now, in 67, in May, the war was in 60, it was in, was in, in June, in May, Frank Cross of Harvard, a great scholar, very much involved in Dead Sea Scrolls, he was taken to a bridge in Beirut, and he was spoken to from under a blanket by Kondo, and Cross told him, Kondo, get out from the blanket. And Kondo offered to sell the scroll to Cross, but Cross couldn't get it out of the country, so he said, I have no way to get it out, I'm not buying it. Okay, by this time, you didn't know where it was. I figure Cross tipped him off. Anyhow, this is what happened. He sent Israeli intelligence agents to get the scroll. This past, I guess it's April, we held the 70th anniversary conference of the Dead Sea Scrolls in Jerusalem. And at that conference, 
at a Hebrew session in which I spoke, the guy who had been the general who supervised this intelligence operation was introduced and spoke for a few minutes. They found him. Anyhow, the agents went, and the agents got the scroll. Kondo was paid $108,000 for it, which was pretty good for the going rate at that time. I mean, he didn't really own it. It was a national treasure. And this scroll was recovered during the 67 war. Now, eventually, the scrolls came under the editorship of Emanuel Tobe of the Hebrew University, pictured with somebody you may or may not recognize. In 1991, Tobe was appointed as editor-in-chief. He completely reorganized the publication team. He is a Hebrew University professor, now professor emeritus, great scholar, good friend, wonderful guy. He made a truly inter interconfessional, interreligious team of scholars from all over the world, and every word of the scrolls is available. You can purchase it without any problem at all and read every single one of the texts in Hebrew, Aramaic, a few that are in Greek. And uh, as a result of this work, the so-called liberation of the scrolls has been completely accomplished, and there no longer are any scrolls being kept by anybody uh, under any circumstances at all. Now, we have to say a little bit about the site of Qumran. This is the area in which the, the buildings that are found on the shore of the Dead Sea where the scroll sect lived. You can see quite a number of things here. The pantry is significant over here, and the dining will be significant. Defensive tower we'll talk about. The water system includes ritual baths. There are some ritual baths in here. There are some remnants around here of some earlier building. There's a cemetery over here. The caves would have been over here. At any rate, looking at this, we'll see a few examples. This is the wadi. And this is cave four where they were found 550 or so manuscripts, but only 5 to 15 percent, or maybe even less, of the whole manuscript in general. We know that by looking at the biblical manuscripts. The other texts, remember three groups, second group apocryphal-like, third group sectarian. We don't know the length of those documents generally, but by looking at the example of the Bibles, we realize that mostly we have 5 to 15 percent of the manuscript. And this is the wadi, the dry riverbed, uh, in which there was amazing, amazing rainfall once or twice a year, and that's the area called Wadi Qumran. At any rate, this is K4. There were apparently holes with shelves, and these shelves had collapsed in antiquity, and when the Bedouin dug it out, which they did on the weekend, as I explained before, and brought those to sell, those manuscripts to sell, they were going through basically a, a meter, which is a little more than a yard, of bat dung and other substances, uh, animal dung, dirt, filth from which they extracted the fragments that had all collapsed, the shelves had collapsed, and that's why the whole thing was such a mess, and that's why we have the fragmentary situation. DeVoe once wrote that it was ripped up by Roman soldiers, and he had in mind Kristallnacht, when Torah scrolls were ripped up by Nazis. There's a man I know in Vienna, by the way, who actually recalls seeing the Torahs on the street in front of the synagogues. He himself saw this. At any rate, DeVoe was wrong because the examination of the breaks scientifically showed that this material had, in fact, just deteriorated as a result of weather and other conditions and was not torn up intentionally. This is Cave 11, where the Temple Scroll came from, and some other, a Psalm Scroll, as well as an Aramaic translation of the Book of Job, and some other important fragments that are here. There's one text which will be interesting to some people here, called the Malchizedek text. Even though it has absolutely nothing to do with Malchizedek in Hebrews, people keep quoting it as if it does. We're going to return to that a little bit later. This is a view from the top, and you can see some of the things that we mentioned before. You've got the defensive tower here, you've got over here, you've got the dining room and the pantry where they kept all the dishes, you've got this round cistern, it's remnant from the first temple period, time of, of the Judean kings, and just so you realize, this is the wadi over here, the cemetery would be around over here. The tourist center right now is built about here, right? And I always jokingly say that you could buy books like mine for double the price, but I think they stopped selling mine. I guess people didn't want to buy a book, you know, for double the price. They take their, their phone, 
They see a nice book, they look on the internet, and they see the real price. They're gonna buy it over there. I can order it right now, it'll be in my home when I get home. So what tourist is gonna buy a book for double the price in Israel? So right, beside which El Al only gives you one suitcase now. They used to give two suitcases, so then maybe you could. This is an amazing problem for us. We have two children in Israel and grandchildren in Israel. And we, we, had, to, we had to convince them to stop ordering shoes and telling us to bring you. have no idea, all right? Because they only allow one suitcase. Okay, anyhow, you take a look here. You see the water system that comes in. You see some of the ritual baths. And we'll see a little of that close up. This is defensive tower. Very important for the following reason. Because a theory was made up that this whole thing was nothing but a fortress. Why is it crazy? Fortresses don't need 11 ritual baths. And just because someone has a defensive tower, if you've got an area like this out in the desert, you've got to have a way of security. So having a defensive tower does not make you into a fortress. Now here are some of the rooms in the middle. These rooms possibly could have been part of some home beforehand, like a farmstead. These are some of the theories. It could be by about 100 BCE, the place was being used by the sectarians that we are talking about who gathered the scrolls and inhabited the place. Now you'll hear some theories which say that this site has nothing to do with the scrolls and the caves. We're not going to have time to defend it completely here. Just I will say that the pottery in the caves matches the pottery in the buildings. The buildings provide the facilities for the life of a sect similar to what's described in the sectarian scrolls, the third group, in the caves. And any attempt to dissociate them is basically wrong. Plain and simple. We could talk about it in the question period more, but it doesn't make any sense. I just want to admit that there are two scholars in the world, one is dead and one is alive, who claim that they are not. Okay. Now, this is the dining room. How do we know there's a dining room? This already indicates something very important. According to the rule of the community, they had communal meals. Because there's a pantry in which Millick excavated 1,200 plates. I think we've got some plates here. And some cups, this is the cup, if you look like, you know, at, the, at the, the paintings of the Last Supper, this is the real cup that they would have used. These are drinking cups from the period, not chalices and all the rest of it, right? Now, the reason that the communal meals are so important is because the sectarian documents say that the group eats sectarian meals in ritual purity, and you only get into the meal if you're at a high enough level of ritual purity. Now, this has been rightly compa compared with purity rules that are followed, followed by the Jerusalem priesthood, purity rules followed by the Pharisees, the forerunners of the Talmudic rabbis, purity rules followed by the Essenes, who may or may not be the same as the Dead Sea sectarians, but are described by Josephus with many similarities and some of the early Christian meals, known as agape rules, except that they don't have meals, except they don't have purity there. Because ritual purity in the Jewish sense is one of the things that anyone who reads the New Testament can see, that Jesus or the early authors don't want purity as a separator. Because purity in Judaism serves as a separator. But anyhow, that's why the meals have been so significant in establishing the idea that this was a communal religious sect. But there is nothing in any way unique about eating communal meals in a religious group. In fact, I just did it at dinner. <laughs> okay. Even though I had the, <laughs> the kosher food. Okay. Now, this is a room that some people call a scriptorium, where you write scrolls. But actually, the scriptorium had to be on the second floor, because there was an inkwell found. And the inkwell, there are actually a couple of inkwells, they were on top of the residue of the collapsed ceiling of the bottom floor, which is, of course, the floor of the upper floor. Right? Everybody understands that, OK? So when it collapsed, and you see that these inkwells are on top, but here's the problem. They used to believe that all the scrolls were written, copied at Qumran. That's not true now. We know that. Some of them predate the settlement in 100 BCE. The earliest biblical material is what we call 4Q, K4, Samuel B, 2nd Samuel manuscript. This Samuel manuscript dates from about 225 BCE. So there's no way, how do we know these things? We know from the history of the script, carbon 14 dating, and other ways. But it dates from about 225 BCE. 
And this particular manuscript was obviously brought to Qumran. We now understand that many manuscripts pre-existed the sectarians or were copied elsewhere and brought to Qumran. When they were brought to Qumran, they became part of the sect's library. So the fact that some scrolls were probably copied there, certainly the sectarian manuscripts, the bulk of it was probably not copied there. Now this is a water tunnel. You might think, looking at that wadi, that the way you get water for Qumran is by raising it from the floor up. That's nuts, because you'll be very tired raising enough water for this big group. There must have been by the dishes, say, 400 people there, 300 people there. So you couldn't possibly raise that much water with that one big rainstorm. Instead, you gathered the water from the top when it rained on the hills above Qumran to the west of Qumran. And this is one of the tunnels. The tunnel is something like a, a half of a yard, like a foot and a half high. And it's lined, as you can see, with lime. And then it runs to above ground aqueducts. Anybody know how you say aqueduct in Hebrew? Aqueduct. In case you're in Israel, you need to find it. But this is not an aqueduct like you see in Caesarea, the big Roman aqueducts with the arches. There's a different kind of an aqueduct. And it runs under the ground and then feeds a big cistern. This stuff with the small stones, that's the leftover from ancient Judea, 8th century BCE. And we're now in the 1st century BCE mostly. And, and, and okay, anyhow. Then it goes to the ritual baths. This is a mikvah, a Jewish ritual bath. Now, the people who claim this wasn't a religious center, so they say this isn't a ritual bath, it's a Roman stepped pool. Does anybody know where you find Roman stepped pools? 600 of them in the land of Israel, and a few others where there are ancient synagogues, like, for example, in Cologne. There's actually an 8th century, it's not so ancient. 8th century quote, Roman stepped pool. So they can say whatever they want. Roman stepped pools are mikvaot, Jewish ritual baths. Obviously, you realize the link between this and baptism, but the problem is how to identify the link, because what the Dead Sea Scrolls have in common with Christian baptism is immersion for the purpose of initiation. But Jewish conversion has the same idea. If a person becomes a Jew, they have to immerse as in part of the initiation rites. So who got it from whom and how they got it, it's a big debate. But this is one of the things that has been cited by some very simplistic people, that immersion in a pool must be the same as baptism, which must mean that Christianity got it from the Dead Sea sect. So let me explain something right now that we're gonna talk about a little bit more as we go on which is that all of these simplistic ideas that this group influenced that group are naive. What we learn from the scrolls and other materials is that there's a world of ideas and approaches to Judaism in the second and first centuries BCE. Now these approaches to Judaism in various ways passed on ideas. Some of those ideas ended up in rabbinic Judaism, I'm sure some got lost, and some ended up in Christianity. But it's not that group A influences group B in a direct way. And I know we had a lecture once of somebody at a conference and somebody didn't like the lecture and he said, this guy thinks that people got on a bus at Qumran and got off at Joanine Church. Because he was claiming that just because of the, the light and darkness imagery, oh, it's all very obvious. The John was totally influenced by Qumran and the Qumran sectarians became, this is silly. This is not how influence works in a culture and society. Think about our culture and society, how complex it is. They did not have a simple culture. So my point is that the scrolls show us a wide background, and that wide background is what explains what happens afterwards as we move into the first century CE, second century CE, and whether we look at the history of Judaism or we look at the history of Christianity. And we don't fall into the trap of these simplistic ideas. So despite what it said in last week's Jerusalem report, they slightly misunderstood something I said. John the Baptist was not at Qumran. Now people ask me, was Jesus ever at Qumran? To which I answer with a wisecrack, I don't know where he went on vacation. <laughs> I can't tell you every place that Jesus was. But if you ask me, was Jesus influenced by the Qumran sect, I have a very big problem. Because Jesus' ethics are the ethics of the Pharisees taken to a height and not the ethics of these people. And Jesus preaches things that are against what these people believe. Because these people, unlike Pharisaic Jews and maybe all Jews, they actually preach hatred of people not in the group. 
They actually do in the rule of the community. And we have to remember something that people don't tell the truth about. There are some ideas in the Dead Sea Scrolls that are beautiful, that we would agree with and that we would appreciate. There are some ideas we don't agree with. And that includes the war scroll idea that in the end of days, everybody but my group is going to basically be killed to bring about the messianic era. We, we don't think that way. We figure either we think everybody's going to come to agree with us or we have a more universal view, but the idea that everybody else could be dead but me and my group, right? We don't accept those kind of ideas, but we have to understand that these people, for a variety of reasons, were radicalized. And so at any rate, though, this example of immersion already shows you the point. It's not that we're looking for direct influence from here on anything. It's that we're looking at all the parallels and seeing how the groups develop in the complex Second Temple history. This is a cistern. Some people tell you that it's not. It would have been covered, and they think it's a mikveh. It's much, I gotta tell you something funny. There are people who have written that they use the same pools to wash, bathe ritually, and eat and drink in Qumran. So I asked the public health guy, and he said, look, you might make it through a year. By the end of year two, everybody would be dead. <laughs> you know, this is a cistern. This, you know why there's a crack in the cistern? Because in 31 BCE, there was a very famous earthquake. And that earthquake left ruins in Qumran, and there's a big debate whether the site was abandoned. This is the cemetery. And how do I know that each pile of stones is a grave? Because under Jordan, they opened up some graves. And Israel doesn't permit the opening up of any graves, but at any rate, we know that the graves were almost all the main cemetery males, and there was a side cemetery with women and children. Now comes the big debate about whether the sectarians were celibate. If you follow Josephus, he says there were two kinds of Essenes, if these are the Essenes. One married, and the other celibate. Now, the scrolls out and out say, that at the age of 20, a man should marry and have sexual relations. That doesn't sound like celibacy to me. And there are all kinds of rules. I just submitted a paper on laws pertaining to purification after childbirth, it's based on Leviticus chapter 15. At any rate, nonetheless, this main cemetery has about 1,200 men. And there's 100 women and children or less. My theory is that men left their families in the mainstream of the land of Israel and came to this place. And they studied there, and when they happened to die, they had to be buried there. But most left and went back to their homes and lived in the life of their family as members of the sect. But I have to admit, this is a minority view. Most people think this group was celibate. If it was celibate, it has some interesting parallels with early Christianity that need to be discussed. So the problem is that the celibacy theory was first put forward by a group of monks. But leave, leave aside that question. It's a very complex problem. I think that the scrolls speak about a married group. I mean, there are verses that say that, but what some people try to argue is that the rule of the community does not mention women. And therefore, they say that shows that they have to be celibate. Does anyone know what famous United States document does not mention women? <laughs> the US Constitution. Yes. Would you believe that? It does not mention women. And they certainly were not celibate. <laughs> I don't know if anybody here has been to Monticello. You, you actually see the, the exhibit there. OK. OK, now, I just show you coins, because coins are a way that the site is archaeologically dated. It's very important. And there were all kinds of coins there. But we don't have too much time for it. Now, just to show you, we're going to speak briefly about the scrolls in the Hebrew Bible. Right? You have here a list of how many books there are. I'll just point out to you that the most popular books, Psalms, Isaiah, and Deuteronomy, excuse my saying it in the reverse order, are the same as the books most quoted in the New Testament. That's just an interesting piece of trivia. Here you see the Isaiah scroll. What's amazing about the Isaiah scroll is that it looks almost like a modern Torah, that there's certain things that remain the same. First of all, the letters hang from the lines. The top margin is to be smaller than the bottom margin, but I did a bad job here cutting it off. I should replace the photo. You can't see it. The bottom margin will be lower. The letters, as I say, hang from lines, and you have intercolumnar margins. And you have to have at least three columns, just like a modern Torah, on each sheet. This, however, is not a regular Isaiah. This Isaiah is rewritten into a dialect of Hebrew 
that was used by the Qumran sectarians. It kind of linguistic update into their strange internal dialect. This is a Leviticus scroll, which is an amazing scroll, and it's written in the ancient Hebrew script, the one that was used before the Second Temple period. It's the ancient Canaanite-like script, but it's the book of Leviticus almost identical to our Leviticus. And here you see a fascinating text. They call this a Deuteronomy manuscript, but it's not. It starts with Deuteronomy 8, which is the obligation to say the grace after meals. Then it goes to Deuteronomy 5, which is Hero Israel, Deuteronomy 5, 6, 6, I'm sorry, which, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 5, which is the Ten Commandments. It goes to Deuteronomy 5, the Ten Commandments, but then in the middle of the Ten Commandments, after telling you that you have to observe the Sabbath because you were slaves in Egypt, which is the Deuteronomic version, it shifts to the Exodus version, and then it says, and, because God created the world in seven days. So it's an attempt to combine both versions of the Ten Commandments. This is something very important to understand. This these sectarians and whoever manuscripts they got make changes in the biblical text to indicate interpretations. Here being that the two versions of the Ten Commandments really say the same thing, which is a fundamental Jewish idea. But at any rate, you see it here in this manuscript. They call this the oldest Ten Commandments, and when the Dead Sea Scrolls were exhibited in New York in Times Square, and by the way, we had a joke because I was in a movie with a woman who works in the Israel Antiquities Authority, and we said, we ever think we'd be in a movie together in Times Square? But at any rate, we're in this movie together, and during Christmas week, between Christmas and New Year's, they brought this manuscript and announced, we're going to have here the earliest Ten Commandments. You couldn't get in the room. People waited an hour and a half to get into the exhibit, and then another hour and a half to get to the Ten Commandments. It was just unbelievable uh, what the crowd was. Okay. This is a Sov's manuscript. You have it in your brochure. This is an amazing manuscript. It contains biblical psalms plus other poems of praise to God. It's absolutely beautiful, and it has in certain things that indicate refrains for ritual use. It's a beautiful text. It's very often exhibited. Okay. Um, this, is just, this is a very interesting piece of Numbers. Now, the book of Numbers has in it certain stories that are explained better in Deuteronomy. The writer of this manuscript copied verses from Deuteronomy into Numbers. Now, if you think that sounds strange, if you get a Greek Bible, Septuagint, or for that matter, a Catholic translation of the Greek Bible, or even a scholarly translation, you will read the book of Numbers uh, it has additions from Deuteronomy. So this shows that exegesis and text were not kept totally separate. This is, by the way, very important for certain New Testament passages where the biblical text of the Hebrew Scriptures appears to have been intentionally altered, but maybe it's part of this rewriting process. And so that's why sometimes you see like a note in your edition that says, the first half of this is Zechariah, the second half is Isaiah. Whatever's going on there is that there is a, some kind of willingness to play with the text for interpretive reasons that certainly was not accepted later on. Here I show you a piece of Daniel. It has the name Daniel right there. And this piece of Daniel, again, every book except for Esther is represented in the Qumran area. This now is passed to a part of, this is Tobit. And Tobit is in the Catholic Bible. Here's a really funny fact. Every Catholic is walking around with one and two Maccabees, the story of the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. No Jew has ever read Maccabees except academics. People take classes. Now, I don't know if any Catholics read Maccabees. Maybe they also didn't read it. But then again, I don't know if anybody ever read Genesis or Mark or whatever is in there, right? So I always tell my students, you have to read the Bible. And if you're ashamed to be seen, read, now this is, you show how out of date, because there used to be a book, right? Today you use your phone. But when there was a book, I told them, they have those plastic covers that people use in the subway reading off-color books. Get one of them, no one will know you're reading the Bible. <laughs> now I just tell them, you want to read the Bible, use your phone, no one will know you're reading the Bible, right? I taught a course, it's very funny, I taught a course in the Jewish background of the New Testament. And all the students, I was the only one with a book. They all had it on their phone. I told them, you don't have to buy a book. You can get it for nothing on your phone. So they were always sitting with the phone and the iPad and all this. I was the only one with a book. And I'm not even that outdated. Okay. But this is a piece of, of, of papyrus with the book of Tobit. 
And now this is a book that's not in the Christian Apocrypha, but is an example of this phenomenon. We call this the Pseudepigrapha. This is a piece of Enoch. Enoch is in the Bibles of the Russian Orthodox. It's an Ethiopic church, certainly, but the Russian Orthodox has it. And this book, of course, is Enoch from Genesis, and it's a whole expansion on his life and his career and everything else about him. But here's the interesting thing. We only had it in Ethiopic and in some parts in Greek. Now we have big parts in Aramaic from the Dead Sea Scrolls. By the way, Enoch is the only book not in the Hebrew Scriptures quoted in the New Testament. I don't know if anyone knows where. I won't even ask. It's embarrassing. It's in Jude. That is the only thing. Go read Jude. has, I think, one chapter, if I remember. It's like Obadiah. So it'll take you five seconds to read it. Don't take out your phone right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is the text I mentioned before, Genesis Apocryphon. tells the stories of Genesis, and we're going to have to move through it. Now we get to the sectarian text. This is the inside of the shrine of the book in Jerusalem, which was built in the 60s. And actually, it's amazing. When I was 15, I was in Israel. It had just opened. And I realized that was my first exposure to the Dead Sea Scrolls. I actually visited the shrine of the book. And at any rate, now we get this is the rule of the community. This is the document that along with the one that we mentioned from the Cairo Geniza, the one called the Damascus document, every book has more than one name, right, in Desi Scrolls, or it's Sadakai fragments. Rule of the community is also called Manual of Discipline. These texts outline the way the sect saw its history and its basic ideology. Very dualistic, everything's predestined in life. They believe everybody is either one of the good or the evil, the sons of light or the sons of darkness. This ideology plus how do you get into the sect? You have to go through a rising set of purity which is connected with the rising understanding of your own religious knowledge and your own self-purification. And then when you attain the pure state, you can first eat of the pure solid food of the group and later the liquid food, because it's more susceptible to impurity, according to Leviticus. But I don't want to ask who's read Leviticus here, uh, but okay. Now, everyone should read Leviticus. But the point is that this document is so fundamental, it's your most important example of the sectarian literature. And this is a piece of that same Damascus document from Qumran to remind you, me to say what I said to you twice already, that that very document found in the medieval manuscripts and debated from 1911 on turned out to be truly a Dead Sea Scroll. This is the Thanksgiving scroll. Believe it or not, this manuscript, when it was found, was crumpled up like when you throw something away in your wastebasket. You would never believe the beautiful poetry in here. And some of this poetry sounds like poetry in the Yom Kippur liturgy. The problem is that it has predestination, which means we're not, it's hard to understand how we're responsible for our transgressions. If we're predestined, very hard to understand this. And besides predestination, it has that idea that everything is divided. And it has, by the way, I hate to say it, but not very positive views of the physical part of life. And this raises a question. Did Paul get his views on that topic from Hellenistic tradition or from Jewish sectarianism? This is an unanswerable question. But there's no, or from both. But this relates to the question of the nature of Paul's understanding of the human body and sexuality, etc., which of course is a whole, you could spend a whole lecture just discussing that. Okay. Now, what do we learn? We're going to now get two things. We're going to speak now and we'll come to the conclusion about relevance to history of Judaism, relevance to history of Christianity. From the point of view of the history of Judaism, first of all, we have some of the earliest examples of Jewish ritual objects. These are phylacteries, known in Hebrew as tefillin. The strap would have run through here. And this is this temple scroll. This has led to an amazing discovery because the laws in this scroll pretty much match the laws in this document over here, which is the so-called MMT text, a foundation document of the sect. And what we have learned is that they are according to the Sadducee priestly view as opposed to the Pharisaic rabbinic view. 
This is a major, major discovery for the history of Judaism that emerged from the study of the scrolls. We now understand that there were two completely competing systems, not just that the Sadducees had a little, some heretical ideas here, some heretical ideas there. This, by the way, is also important for understanding material in the New Testament about the Sadducees. But of course, Josephus, the historian, gives us a lot more information. You know, we put this here so I should look at that. I just want to look over there. Okay. Now, just showing you, we're not really talking too much about this. This is the Copper Scroll. Amazing thing. Somebody wrote a scroll describing buried treasures on copper. We don't really know what this is. It was found in K3 at Qumran, but here's what I want to tell you. For the history of Judaism, this document is actually an example showing us the transition between biblical Hebrew and the Hebrew of the rabbis, second, third, fourth century. So it's exceedingly important for that. History of language is a very important part of history of culture. And then the war scroll. Now, I show you this, but I really want to talk about Jewish messianism for a minute. There are two basic messianic concepts in the Dead Sea Scrolls. One, priestly messiah is the head messiah because the temple is the most important thing in the end of days. And then there's an Israel messiah who's the temporal ruler. That's concept number one. Concept number two, Davidic Messiah, the one everybody knows. A descendant of David is going to be the Messiah. Now, concept number two, the one Messiah concept, Davidic Messiah, underlies the whole idea of Jewish Messianism and Christian Messianism. Because, of course, the identification by the Gospels of Jesus as descendant of David is based on this. However, both Judaism and Christianity have echoes of the priestly Messiah. Here or there. And the main, most important echo of the priestly Messiah in Christianity is in Hebrews. Now, the point is, funny story about Hebrews. There was a whole day of Hebrews at the International Society for Biblical Literature. So I said, this is great. I'm going to get a whole education about Hebrews. I come in. So somebody asked me, am I writing a book about it? I said, no, don't worry. I'm not writing a book about it. He was doing a dis dissertation. Anyhow, somebody says, well, how'd you decide to come to this program? It's very simple. I said, I saw a Hebrew on the door. I figured I'll go in. <laughs> But anyhow, it was fantastic. In a whole day, I got such an education about Hebrews, the scholarship on the epistle to Hebrews. And it's just wonderful. But the epistle to Hebrews has a priestly messiah idea. Right? So this is very important. So actually what happens in Christianity is that all the messianic ideas that we find in Qumran are in different degrees used to explain Jesus. And the war scroll, however, talks about this great battle of the end of days and actually, in certain ways, it's opposite to Christianity. Because it's opposite to the idea that the kingdom of God will come about in a peaceful manner. In fact, it's opposite to, there are two views of messianism regarding this in Judaism. One, that the world will evolve to get better and better. And this is the opposite view, that there will have to be a cataclysm because the world will be about to destroy itself in a nuclear war or some terrible thing like that, and then God will have to send his Messiah. Those two points of view are next to each other in Judaism. In fact, they're next to each other in Christianity, too. If you compare Revelation to the Gospel's idea of the kingdom of God, you'll see the same thing. So the scrolls show these two competing ideas that compete both in, in, in Judaism and in Christianity. Okay, now what about the background of Christianity? You know, we can't separate these topics, but make sure to talk about it. So this is a very interesting example. This is the commentary in Habakkuk. The fulfillment passages in the New Testament have a lot in common with these commentaries. The Pesher commentaries are contemporizing. They are designed to tell us that the ancient prophets are talking about our own day. This is very much like the this comes to fulfill what the prophet Isaiah said in the Gospels. So basically this material, Pesher material, is in certain ways parallel to Gospel ideas. Here you see a text that we call Beatitudes. It begins, happy or blessed are those who, and has a series of such Beatitudes. Now the problem is, if you turn around and say that this is parallel to Christianity, it's also prominent in Judaism. So it seems we're talking about here about a common element to Judaism and Christianity, but it's a very, very beautiful text. And what it shows you, again, is what I said about how it's not that group A influences group B, is that the scrolls allow us to understand a whole world of ideas which are influencing the subsequent sorting out 
of the different ideas within Judaism and Christianity. This is an amazing text. This is called the Messianic Apocalypse. It begins right on the top, you see the word Messiah, Mashiach in Hebrew right there, right? It says that the whole world will listen to God's Messiah, and it proceeds to outline how when the Messiah comes, God will raise the dead and he will cure the sick and do all these things. Now, this raises an important question because the question of resurrection. The scrolls, some of the scrolls that are apparently not from the sectarians believe that resurrection will happen in the end of days. However, there are scrolls that believe, sectarian scrolls, that the end of days are going to happen immediately. And since the sectarians are the only ones going into the end of days, you don't need resurrection. It'll happen in their lifetime. So we have some scrolls that, according to the book of Daniel, for example, they're following the book of Daniel's idea of resurrection in the end of days. And resurrection in the end of days is believed both in Judaism and Christianity. It's an example of a commonality rather than a difference. But this is a beautiful text. You could, there we get to the funny stuff. Here's the false Christian parallels. This is the text they call the pierced Messiah text but there's no pierced Messiah in the text. The problem is that the people who read this didn't see, you can't see it over here, but there are some letters on the bottom that can barely be seen here, which indicate that the people to be killed here are the Romans that were expected to attack in 63 BCE. But they published this to the press and said there's a pierced Messiah text, and a lot of people believe there was a pierced Messiah text. Rather, it's a text which describes how the sectarian leader will kill the leaders of the Romans in the war which they expected to happen in the end of days in the war scroll. Now, this is another one which is really interesting. Two Orthodox rabbis in LA published that the name of Jesus, you can't see it right over here, but it's about over here in the text. And they have Yud Shin Vav I in Hebrew Yeshua, which of course is the name of Jesus in Hebrew. The problem is that if you actually read the text, it's a quotation of the biblical book of Joshua. It says that Joshua said that after he destroyed Jericho, that anyone who tries to build it will be cursed when he puts up its walls, and he'll the put up its walls, he'll lose his first son, and his second son will die when he puts up the gates. So it's a quotation of the book of Joshua that these rabbis didn't know was a quotation of the book of Joshua. The LA Times published that Jesus was mentioned in the scrolls. So let's make sure we understand. Neither Jesus nor John the Baptist is mentioned in the scrolls for a very simple reason. These texts were composed before they were born, A. And B, they don't have any direct connection to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that's the stuff that you read in all this phony literature. And that's where you have to understand again what I said eight times already, that it's not about direct connection. It's about creating, as we need to do, a world that tells us the background upon which our religious traditions grew up. This is another example, but this is a real example, because this is a text that refers to the Messiah as a son of God. It comes from probably the third or second century BCE, and it is an example of our ability to learn that son of God was a term among some Jews in that period for the Messiah whom they expected, and all theories to the contrary about this text don't seem to hold water. It seems that that's what it, it indicates to us. Biddy that included some anti-Semites. Some people were not anti-Semites, but some were. And for this reason, they tried to keep the material out of the hands of Jews and excluded Jews from publication. Now, when the publication dispute took place, this overturned this, of course, and created a situation in which the scrolls were now in a truly interreligious uh, committee and were therefore published. All of these events need to be seen as part of a much wider story, which we don't have time to talk about today. But as a result of the Holocaust and some very honest soul searching, to a great extent, by the way, in this country previous to its spreading abroad, because that's a whole story of Nostra Aetate that isn't really told, the American role. But it resulted eventually during Vatican II in the statement that we heard before, Nostra Aetate. And it's not just that the Catholic Church changed its view, but it's that the Catholic Church's attempt to change their view spread all over the place within many Christian groups. 
beliefs. So the Catholic Church exercised here a type of leadership that I don't know whether they understood they were exercising among many groups. It doesn't mean that there aren't leftover groups that have not adopted this, but it had a lot of influence. Now, as a result of that, the scrolls came into their own in the very same period. And a colleague of mine, Eileen Schuler, who is in fact a nun, but Eileen Schuler has written a paper discussing the effect of the scrolls on the developments we're talking about. Why? Because the scrolls emphasize commonality in origins of Judaism and Christianity and emphasize the extent to which Christianity was influenced by basic Jewish ideas and therefore caused the reflection, wait a minute, how can we be against the people who reject the tradition that in fact is our own origins? And this is one of the things that the scrolls did. Now the scrolls, interestingly, here's a very interesting fact. The scrolls are to a great extent documents of strife between various sects of Jews. And in fact, the sectarians themselves in their scrolls, that third third, much of the stuff is very antagonistic to other people, other Jews, non-Jews. And nonetheless, the scrolls turned out to be one of the factors in unifying Jews and Christians in study of the scrolls and especially in their influence on making us understand more and more the uh, commonalities in the origins of Christianity with the Judaism on which it's based, and the fact that there are various common elements even with the many, many differences, which we shouldn't forget, because in my view, good relations mean we accept the fact that we don't agree on things, but we still want to be friends. So that's the way the scrolls have helped to function in this purpose. Now, the question is, does any of this matter? Why do scrolls matter? That was the subtitle. First of all, it's a treasure of new information about Second Temple Judaism. Obviously, we've heard how it influences our understanding of the history of Judaism and Christianity. But ironically, these documents that themselves are documents of strife turn out to be a kind of symbol of the new understanding of the relationship of Jews and Christians, Christians seeing the Jews as the source of the shared scripture, Jews understanding ancient and modern relationships that need to exist in order to work together for common interests. Now, another aspect we need to talk about is that the Israel Antiquities Authority is currently building a new building. They are the guardians of the scrolls since the day they took it away from those who had it. They are the ones who shared the scrolls in exhibits all over the world. They are the ones who made sure that they were published. They deserve an amazing amount of credit. And while we're talking today, 70 years of Israel, this is one of Israel's biggest accomplishments, the way in which they support archaeological scholarship, scholarship on the souls, and other texts. Thank you very much. A particular Hebrew text that's a source of the two Messiahs? Um, in a certain sense, no. You're asking the question like this. Is there a Hebrew Bible passage which talks about two Messiahs? The answer is no. Now we have to remember that the one Messiah concept, the typical one, is in pieces in the Hebrew Bible. That is to say the restoration of the Davidic kingdom is in one place. The idea of the things like the day of the Lord, which would lead to a destruction of the wicked, is in another place. In a third place you have the resurrection of the dead. Different messianic ideas that are in different places became a unity in the Dead Sea Scrolls text. I can't think of a text that speaks about two Messiahs Messiahs, except for one thing, Elijah as the harbinger of the Messiah, because he was a priest. But that's not the same as two Messiahs. So I would say no. So Psalm 145, which appears in the Jewish liturgy three times a day, has in it an acrostic. That is to say, the first line starts with the first letter of the alphabet, then the second alphabet. Okay. The original, in quotes, that we have in our Bibles, has no verse for the letter Nun, which is essentially where N is, comes to M, N, L, it's in the same place. Now, there is a verse in the scroll that I showed you that appears on your program tonight that actually has that letter. Now, the question is, is that the original? I would argue no, and let me explain why. If you go to the Greek Bible, the Septuagint, they have a verse for Nun, and their verse looks like a nice verse. If you look at the verse in our psalm scroll, the first half looks like a nice verse. The second half is a repeat of another verse. The original author would never have had in the second stick 
of, you know, how they are, these parallelism sentences like in Psalms, right? He never would have had the same half verse twice. So I am in a minority believing that we do not have the original yet. We might have the original of the first half, maybe, but we don't have the whole original. And so I'm a minority. Give me the second question now. The second question is about the 39 anomalies of the, of the Sefer Torah. Yeah. Because we see, you talked about all the, the uh, liberal approach they had with text. Yes. And how do we get those 39 anomalies and perhaps you could point to uh, sources or references? Like okay, so first of all, the reference about the scribal traditions of the scrolls is Immanuel Tov, two books, Introduction to the, whatever it's called, to the, to the textual criticism of the Hebrew Bible, and the scribal, whatever he calls, techniques of the scrolls. You can get both of them free online to just read it online, okay? That's A. Now here's the, the important thing that we're talking about here. Let me explain it so everybody can understand it. There are scribal anomalies, odd things, in a Torah scroll. There are small letters, there were large letters, there were dots, different things that Jewish tradition gives different explanations that happen once in a while in the Torah, although most of the letters all look the same. The question is, do any of these exist in the scroll? So here's the some semi-answer. First of all, dots are used for erasure in the scrolls. If you want to get rid of a letter, you put dots. So this goes with the rabbi's understanding that sometimes a dot might be put over something because there's question if it's really authoritative in the text or not. Second of all, there are in B Jewish Bible texts certain little annotations that tell you that something should be read differently than it says. Some of those can be found paralleled in differing readings in the scrolls. On the other hand, the scrolls do not have the same exact, or any of the fact, these peculiarities. See, there are small letters in the scrolls when corrections are made. But the whole idea that, let's say, I give an example, in here always the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So in that sentence, right, there is, there, there are, there, for example, the Dalit, is made very large on one so that you shouldn't say that it's the Hebrew word for other instead of the word for one. You won't find that in the scrolls. There is no, there's no uniformity to these things in the scrolls because some of these are later traditions. Much of the Jewish scribal tradition originates in the late Talmud, Talmudic period and then is developing mostly in the period running the early Islamic period. And this appears to be the case with many of these things. Now don't tell some people who think that Moses had his Torah scroll, had every one of these details exactly the same. The, the scrolls really show us that there is a history to the scribal arts and that there's a history to the traditions of how things are written. So here I have to tell you something. Eugene Ulrich, who's a great scholar, by the way, he's a Catholic. He used to teach at Notre Dame. He's a great scholar of the textual history of the Bible in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He says, the good news is that our Bible is their Bible, that the Bible is the same Bible. And the bad news is that there are some differences in transmission the way that they were transmitted. But I have a funnier way of putting it. I say, you're not going to find in, the, in their text, no matter what little variance, thou shalt steal. And you certainly won't find thou shalt commit adultery. So, you know, it's their Bible is our Bible. So just to clarify, then I won't ask any more questions because I want to give other people the chance. Just to clarify, I, the Sofrus texts I've looked at, and I, I continue to study them. Work, and you're talking about the Masora, about how things happened earlier. Yeah. Through, so to get what we have. Right. So, we're. Are there uh, books that go into that that I can pursue? And the best thing is the Tove stuff. I think it'd give you better. I don't think there's a good synthesis, really. His is all about details. That's okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the fragment that I actually showed you, which I said this is the same fragment of the same text found in the medieval manuscript, that fragment describes how a person is expelled. But here's the problem. The problem is there is not one stitch of evidence that John the Baptist was expelled from the community. What is the big parallel? I mentioned it to you. John the Baptist, by the way, I just want to tell you something funny. Did anybody know the first person that we know was named at his circumcision ceremony? Not that he invented the ceremony. The first person that I can name by name named at his circumcision ceremony is John the Baptist. Now, that was the Jewish custom then, but I can't give you the name of any other person before him, okay? So anyhow, here's the point about John the Baptist at Qumran. What's parallel is the idea of immersion for initiation. 
That's parallel. There's <laughs> anything else. And people wrote tons of stuff, much of which is interesting research on John the Baptist and interesting re research on immersion and on baptism. But you can't tie John the Baptist to Qumran. Well, if you tell me geographically, there's a big problem about the geographic connection because Qumran is located, yes, approximately in the area we're talking about, but there's a whole big gigantic area and, and he could have been anywhere. Right? Of course, you know, today the baptismal site was moved may, way up north because it was polluted near Qumran, so they couldn't have it there. I got to tell you a funny story. I went with my wife to visit the baptismal site, which is up near Tiberias. We were ri driving up to visit. We said, hey, we see the sign. Let's go in there and see what's going on. I had actually visited the one near Qumran uh, years before. So we went in there and you know, they're having people are baptizing. So we see that there's an ice cream stand. And of course, in Israel, the ice cream is almost all, I mean, to find an unkosher ice cream, how you find it. So we decide we're going to have ice cream. These people try to figure, what the heck are these Orthodox Jews doing there? They could never dream that I'm a Dead Sea Scroll scholar who wants to see how Christians are baptizing today in, in the Jordan River. But anyway, it was very funny. So here's the thing I want to say. This stuff is imagined. It's imagined because of the assumption that if we have two things that have some similarity they, and we don't know anything else, they must be the same. So I always said, if you look at the screen here, maybe 5% of the screen is known to us today. We don't know everything that was going on. For all we know, there was some group we never heard of. And, and if we had their records, John's name was down there for paying his membership dues. We just don't know. But let me, let me give you another very important argument. John the Baptist and Josephus' teacher, Bonus, they are one-man hermit people. That is to say, they are alone and they're teaching. Now that's totally different than a group that sees it necessary to bring together people into a sect. Now if I read the text in the New Testament about John the Baptist, he's relating to individuals as he related to Jesus. So what does this have to do with the sect? The answer is, I know about him, I know about them. He immerses, they immerse. Therefore, he must be them. I, I don't, I, that's my problem. I think that's a very, not the, that's a way that leads to too simplistic an explanation. Yeah, when they expelled them, when they were not to be given any food, they were to die out in the desert or something like that, is there any discipline to these things? Well, according to, here's what you're talking about. According to Josephus, People who took the Essene oaths, now we could assume that maybe the sectarians are the Essenes, that's the general theory of most scholars. So, according to him, once they, there are texts to expel members that violate the rules. So he says that some members were expelled, and after being expelled, because they had taken oaths only eat the pure food, they starved to death. Now, first of all, I don't believe that. If someone kicked me out of his group, I wouldn't continue keeping his rules if I was starving to death. And, and he says that, I think he's an exaggerated idea, right? But there's simply no evidence that John was ever there, let alone that he was kicked out. That's the problem. Was there an Essene gate in Jerusalem? Well, there was an Essene gate, yes, because that's the name of, name of place. Now, the question is what that gate means, we don't know. It could mean there was an Essene quarter in Jerusalem. That could very well be, and that is the view of many scholars. We have this text which speaks about how somebody will be called Bar Elohim, son of God. And that's a term, by the way, which actually is in the Zohar, the Jewish mystical work, and actually occurs in the Jewish prayer book when the Torah is taken out. But leave that aside. The point is, and it speaks about this person, and then it speaks about how he will bring peace, etc., right? And uh, basically it's a description of a, of a figure, a re I don't know if we could say really redemptive, but of a figure that, that in many ways looks like a messianic figure. And, you know, this text is easy to find on internet because it's so well, it's called the Aramaic Apocalypse. And it, it basically, you can look on your phone while we're sitting right here. But at, at any rate, and it's, what it, it's hard to judge. You see, when it first came out, there were these silly statements again. Ah, the Christians read the Dead Sea Scroll. They go, oh, okay. Now, and, and therefore, that's got the idea that the Messiah must be the Son of God. Is it, these things are much more complicated. But what it does indicate is that some Jews use that term 
for some type of a redeemer in second or third century BCE. So it's not on no background. Now, how to sort out the details of it, I'm, I'm not sure, because that's, that's what we know. See, as you can probably figure out, I don't like to make up, based on what we do know, stories that we don't know in order to claim that I can solve the biggest questions about the history of Judaism and Christianity, some of which we have to face till we don't know everything. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Great presentation in the sense on the Dead Sea Scrolls, but I would like to maybe make a little footnote here about John the Baptizer. You think that John the Baptizer really didn't have any connection with the, the Essene community uh, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, one of my teachers in the sense of one of the guides in Jerusalem reminded us that John the Baptizer may be an expelled. And that was my question to you in the lecture, that because, because of that, those who were expelled from the Essene community were supposed to go out to the desert and actually die. People weren't actually supposed to help them in any way. And we see that John the Baptizer is eating uh, wild honey and locust and dressed in a uh, skin clothing, in a sense like that, that he's surviving out in the desert. And because of that, in the sense, we find that he has the image of being Elijah, returning before the Messiah comes. And in that case, in the sense that Matthew, Mark, and Luke see John the Baptizer as Elijah returning, but in the Gospel of John, that has been set aside, that he has not Elijah returned. And so with that, in the sense, just a, a little footnote and a little part of speaking to you on camera without you were able to answer me, uh, I put my two cents in. So as we said, the, the uh, Nostra Aetate series is a morphing of the Rabbi Meyer Memorial Lecture series because after Rabbi Meyer had passed, we set up this series of lectures that would be done in memory of him. And in 1994, one year after he dies, he dies in 1995, we have Joseph Fitzmaier, as I mentioned in our opening, who worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he was out at the Ecole Biblique, which is the Dominican School of Scripture in Jerusalem. And he worked on those Dead Sea Scrolls along with Father Ray Brown. And so there was an awful lot of work done on what they found in the, those scrolls and in the archeological finds. And I found that very interesting that he started off the series with Rabbi Meyer, and he's coming to the end of the Rabbi Meyer series, now morphing in to the Nostri Aetate series. And you're kind of closing that circle for us over these many years in the sense that we've been having that series. Along with that, then, as we are talking about the Nostri Aetate series, we find that over these past years, in the sense of having this series out of the villa, we had Rabbi Bleck talking about the hidden Jewish message of Michelangelo on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. That was back in 2014. And then we had Susan Tamarkin Goodman, who came on and spoke on the works of Mark Chagall, Between Two Worlds. And that's a very famous painting of the crucifixion of Jesus wearing the pray prayer shawl covering his uh, circumcision showing us that definitely he is of the Jewish race and the background of the Jewish people and basically giving us some insight into the artwork that tells us about the suffering of the Jewish people. And then James Grimes, who did the book on Violence of Hope, was brought in to talk about the program that was going on and restoring those violins that were used as the people would go to the gas chambers at Auschwitz in Poland, and as they were hearing this music and all that, some of those violins were actually preserved in a sense and restored, and that's the story of the violins of hope. That was Edith Stein, uh, the Jewish person who was a, became a Carmelite sister, was probably going to the gas chamber hearing that type of music. And so basically that violins of hope in 2016 gave us that insight into what happened during the Holocaust. And then we had Dr. Tom Crane coming in from Pennsylvania, where they teach on, uh, uh, concerning the, uh, the Shoah, the execution of the Jewish people, and gave us a virtual reality tour of the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. That was in 2017. So all these programs, in a sense, that are, have been given uh, to us 
by the Nostra Aetate Foundation is giving us, again, insight into our history and who we are and why we are and what we are to believe. This series will continue on, and as we continue with the series, we hope that basically we'll learn more about our faith and what it means, that we are rooted in Christi Judy Christianity is rooted in Judaism, and we have our roots in the sense in the Torah, because Jesus came to fulfill the Torah. He says in the Gospel of Matthew, I haven't come to change one yod or tittle of the law. I've come in the sense to fulfill it. So as we understand that history, I think Larry Schiffman, in a sense, gave us some insights in how that it was connected to the scrolls that were found at Qumran, just outside the Dead Sea, in what we call the Holy Land. Thank you for listening. Until next time, Shalom. Catholic Diocese of Youngstown was established on May 15, 1943. 2018 marks the 75th anniversary of the diocese. There are six counties which make up the Diocese of Youngstown, Ashtabula, Columbiana, Mahoning, Portage, Stark, and Trumbull. There are five other dioceses in the state of Ohio, Cincinnati being the oldest, Cleveland, Youngstown's mother diocese, Columbus, Steubenville, and Toledo. Youngstown is the smallest in terms of area and the second smallest in terms of population, yet it has a third highest percentage of people identifying themselves as Catholics. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future. It was in Dungannon, Ohio, in Columbiana County, that the first group of Catholics settled. St. Philip Neri, the first parish in all northern Ohio, was founded in 1817 under the title of St. Paul's Settlement. It was to visit this settlement that Father Edward Fenwick, the Apostle of Ohio, made his first trip to northern Ohio. Four years later, Cincinnati was chosen as a sea city in the state state of Ohio, and Fenwick was selected as the first bishop. Today, St. Philip Neri remains the oldest parish in the Diocese of Youngstown, but it is also one of the smallest. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future. The first Catholic parish established in Portage County in 1831 near Randolph Suffield was St. Joseph Church. Years later, John Newman, who would become the first American male to be canonized, was sent there to give a mission to help heal the divisions that occurred between the German Catholics who had settled there. Perhaps that is what made him a saint. The parish is also noted for its school, which dates back to 1832, being the oldest English-speaking school west of the Alleghenies. The church is also famous for its Lord Shrine, which has welcomed pilgrims since 1927 and is the only exact replica of the world-famous grotto at Lourdes in France. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future. After the Catholics of Warren stopped meeting in their homes and organized a structured parish, they used a former Episcopalian church for their worship. St. Mary's Mission was established in 1837. Yet the first resident pastor did not come to the parish until 1868. Other parishes quickly grew up in Trumbull County, including St. Stephen Niles in 1853, St. Patrick Hubbard 
in 1869, St. Vincent de Paul Vienna in 1871, now called St. Thomas the Apostle, and St. Rose Gerard in 1892. The other 15 parishes in the county were established after the turn of the 20th century. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future. In 1847, the parish of St. Columba was established. It would eventually become the Cathedral Church when the diocese was formed in 1943. It was the first parish in the city of Youngstown and in all Mahoney County. The first church built in 1851 was to be on land in Briar Hill that was donated by David Todd, who became the first and so far only governor from Mahoning County. A second church was built in 1864, and in 1897, the third church was erected on the site of the present cathedral. A tragic fire destroyed the cathedral in 1954, but by 1958, a new cathedral was dedicated which serves Catholics today. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future.